Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast here in lovely Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune. Joining with me, co-host Joel Mangin, um, and this is going to be a pilot episode for Joel um, co-hosting as we discuss market stats in the Greenville area, so I'm excited for that. Uh, But usual housekeeping that we got to do first, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any of your local real estate needs. And I don't know why you would need to reach out to Joel, but if you need to reach out to him as well, reach out to me and then I'll connect you. (laughs) I'll connect you with Joel. I don't think you'll need to reach out to Joel though. Um, But um, uh, just a reminder as always as well, please like, rate, review, subscribe. Um, If you're watching this on YouTube, comment. By the way, I I should mention as well, um, YouTube uh, recently picked up uh, podcasts as a audio feature. If it's confusing, if you're wanting to watch the video for this, um, there is a separate track for the video. Um, it's all in my same Selling Greenville Pod uh, channel on YouTube. I'm still figuring out whether there is a way for me to not have those be two separate entities. I'm not sure if that's a possibility, but there is now a separate audio and separate video for every podcast on YouTube. So make sure that you actually search for the video if you're wanting to look at all the cool charts that we're going to be looking at today. But as I mentioned before, uh, I have Joel Mangin on the show with me. Um, Joel is a longtime friend, also business partner. um, And uh, yeah, we go back a long way. So Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dan. It's, uh, It's an honor to be here. Thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm excited to talk about stats. So let's get yes, into it. stats are so very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I, in case the audience is wondering, I I really felt like you know this would be a good opportunity to kind of mix things up when it comes to this episode. This is an episode that I do every month. The Greater Greenville Association of Realtors produces really great data for us every single month. Um, but talking through data sometimes can get boring sometimes can be dry so i'm hoping with joel maybe this will make things a little bit more interesting maybe mix things up a bit so i'm just going to dive right in here and we're going to dive right into the data starting with new listings now new listings were there's a lot of very interesting stuff when it comes to the new listings data i just want to point out a few things real quick first off Year on year for the month of April. So I'm recording this May 24th. Unfortunately, we just got this data just a few days ago. So I wasn't able to do this earlier. So I apologize for that. That was um, just a a quirk with when the data was released. But we're looking at April's numbers, even though we're here at the end of May. So April's new listings data was 2,226 new listings, which was a a whopping 27.5% increase year on year. That's like, that's the, the, I mean, that's got to be the largest year-on-year increase that we've had in several years. If you're looking at the chart on the YouTube video, you can see it is the second largest month of new listings that we've ever had, um, falling just short of the, I believe that that was June of 2022. Let me see, January, February, March, April, May. Yeah, that was June of 2022. Um, And what happened in June of 2022? That was when uh, the mortgage rates started to go up. And that was when it became very apparent, okay, this period of very, very low rates is coming to an end. Um, And so we had a a tremendous spike that summer. And as it turns out, April of this year, we had a similar spike. So um, I don't know what that means for uh, the rest of the year so far. We'll have to see. Uh, but a really huge new listings number for the month of Mar- uh, for the month of April, twenty twenty four. Any thoughts you have on any of that, Joel? Yeah, so um, I, I noticed this is really seasonal, and that <clears throat> that other high watermark you just pointed out in twenty twenty two seems you know anomalous when you look at the the other spikes. So I guess my question is, what do you know? Are there any factors that kind of led into this was this a surprise to you or or can you talk about that yeah this is a surprise for me so um if you're if you're following real estate as closely as i do you hear a lot of people talking about uh the so-called lock-in effect um the lock-in effect is people that are that have really really low mortgage rates and can't move 
uh, in effect because they would have to be getting going from a 3% mortgage rate to a 7% rate potentially or, or something like that. And the result of that lock-in effect has been that we have seen the new listings data from, I mean, if, if you go back to, if you look at that peak in June, you can see that there was a precipitous fall, right? This is, uh, if you're looking on, on video again here, I'm pointing out December of 2023 was the lowest new listings number since December of 2018. So we had the lowest number of new listings in five years in December of 2023. Um, and then we had a very weird crown pattern that happened um, in, sorry, that was December of 22. Then we had a really uh, strange crown pattern that happened uh, throughout the year in 2023, uh, where we, you know, it just kept going up and down. Um, and so where I'm going with all of this is that we clearly saw a lock in effect that happened during this period of time when new listings data really, really dropped. What it looks like is happening now is that we're starting to see pent up new listings demand happening. So these are people that need to move. Most people that are sellers are also buyers. These are people moving by and large. These could also be investors deciding that, you know, hey, that investment I bought in 21 or 22 isn't working out the way I hoped it would. Um, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing this new listings data catch up to what it would have been, um, I think, uh, had we, you know, just kind of continued with that lower rate environment. So a moment ago, you said pent up new listing demand. That's new listing supply, essentially, right? Um, so we need to think about supply in, in two different ways. Um, so, okay. and and this actually is a, is a good point that you bring up because this data can be manipulated by doomers to try to make different points. Um, there is active supply and there is new supply. Active supply okay. is just any given time you take a snapshot of the market, how many properties are for sale, that is active supply. New listings are what what we look at basically over the course of the entire month. It's not it's not a one day snapshot. It is a month snapshot. How many new listings came online during that month? So so that's a really important detail because just because new listings skyrocket doesn't necessarily mean that supply skyrockets, right? Because it can be offset by demand. If new listings increase dramatically likely demand also increases dramatically and that's something we'll we'll talk about here in a little bit so let's go ahead unless you had any any other questions do you okay let's go ahead and move no. on to the next one which is pending sales so now we're getting into the demand side of things um pending sales is the count of properties in which offers have been accepted in a given month and just a fair warning to everyone uh warning that i always make is that this pending sales data is always inaccurate for the most recent month, which is in this data, April. Um, so I'll come back to April here in a second, but we got to look at the March data. The March data was down. Pending sales were down 6.3% year on year. It was uh, 1,425 pending sales versus 1,521 uh, in March of 2023. So that was a minus 6.3% increase or 6.3% decrease. Um, so that is something that, I don't think is particularly noteworthy. We had had several months of increases, but those increases had been going down. So November was 10.8% uh, 10 increase in pending sales, then December 9.8, then January 5.8, February 5.4. And now we have a, a decrease in pending sales. And, and the short reason for that, and I kind of prepped this before uh, last month's episode when we went over this, was that March was just a massive, massive month last year. So we're comparing against a really, really massive month. It's not really as noteworthy as it would appear that the pending sales for March of this year did not meet the pending sales of March of last year because March of last year was uh, really for by uh, by 2023 standards was a bit of an anomaly of a month. And if you're looking at the dot plot, you can see that March and April uh, were neck and neck, really hand in hand. But those two months stand out last year versus the rest of the year. 
Um, so we so we had fewer pending sales, fewer homes going under contract March of last year. Um, but uh, I'm I'm not drawing any major conclusions about that what that means for the market. As far as what pending sales will shake out as for April of of uh, of this year, since like I said, April the April data, which currently is saying only 967 pending sales, which would be catastrophic for a, a Greenville April. Um, that data is going to be revised. So last month thought that March was 960, and then that got revised to what I just said, 1,425. April is projecting, April is currently showing 967. So that's probably going to get revised into the mid 1400s as well. Um, but that's still going to be a decrease. So we're still going to see a year on year decrease, April of 24 versus April of 23. Again, those were two really big months. Those were the only really big months of uh, of the year for pending sales that we had. Stan, I have a question on this. What what explains the the drastic revision there? I mean, <laughs> going from nine hundred to fourteen hundred, that seems like uh, it seems like more than just like it, we're waiting on a few places to report. That just seems like a huge amount. So, what's causing that? That's a great question. I mean, this is all coming from MLS data, um, and for whatever reason, there's just a few data points that. Um, that tend to be inaccurate, and I, I have no idea. The all of this data does get revised over uh, over the months. Like even the the new listings data that we just went over. Like I looked at March, and and the the new listings for March actually got revised higher than what they were um, last month when we were looking at this data. So this all gets uh, gets revised. It gets updated, um, but. To be completely honest, I, I would have to talk to the multiple listing service in Greenville to figure out exactly why, you know, we're talking about like a 50% decrease in the pending sales versus what they should be. And I I couldn't right. I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. Because in, in your experience, it's fifty percent of homes under contract are not dropping, right? I mean that that would that's the one thing I can think of where it's like, oh you know, somebody pulled out where it was pending and then maybe started at the end of the month, it was pending, but then they pulled out. I'm sure that would, would explain a percentage, but not the, you know, 50% you just referred to. So yeah, just curious about that. Yeah, I, I have no idea. That's actually something I plan to look into because um, I'm actually now overseeing the MLS committee um, as uh, part of my responsibilities with the board at, at the Greater Greenville Association of Realtors. So um, that, that, is a role that I just took recently and I've, we've had other, uh, other things going on with, uh, NAR settlements and, uh, buyer agency, uh, commission compensation things. Uh, but this is, this is on my radar, something that I plan to, uh, to address. Um, let's move on to closed sales. This one is typically, um, a, a pretty accurate number. It's the count of actual sales that closed in a given month. April was up 15.8% year on year. It was 1,394 versus April of last year, 1,204. Now, I've explained this a few times. Closed sales and pending sales are kind of tied at the hip, right? Because obviously it goes pending and then you go through the whole process and then it closes and then it becomes a closed sale. Um, and so this it shouldn't be surprising that it was uh, a, a pretty high number because we had several months to start the year with increases and then that results uh in in pending sales and then that results in a um in a big close sale number this is still a bigger number though than i would expect 15.8 percent this is telling me that probably fewer homes uh fewer contracts than uh than we have been seeing are falling through um so that's good if you're a seller um i have a hunch you know, March was down year on year. I have a hunch that we'll probably see a few months that are kind of um, year on year. You know, for instance, May might be down year on year. Um, and then we might see June up year on year. I think we're going to see this kind of fluctuate a little bit uh, because last year was still not a normal year. Um, you know, like the the gap from March to April in in closed sales was much different than we would normally have. Um, so I'm, I'm expecting that we're, we're still kind of normalizing when it comes to, uh, to these closed sales and, uh, and, and what we're likely to see is a few down months, a few up months, uh, with the net at the end of the year probably will be, uh, will be a positive, 
and and probably a, a pretty strong positive year uh for for closed sales versus 2023 is what i think yeah nothing any thoughts really or any questions on me. that nothing stands out to me too much other than when i just kind of zoom out and look at the historical data it seems like there's you know 14 15 16 a really good consistency in the way these numbers move yep. and what you just referred to kind of feels like echoes of you know covid and and the whole disruption that's been happening over the last few years so it does seem like it's kind of trying to normalize in a way mm -hmm. but overall it's still trending up which i find interesting yeah and you know you can see traditionally in most years june is where the peak is and so right. it's you it's usually a gradual gain up to that june peak and this is what we talk about the the you know the hot market if if you're if you're looking at you know the graph that i've got on on the video the hot market are the hot market is these kind of you know depending on the year four or five months starting in uh usually around april and then ending usually around july so that's like the peak real estate season but the peak of the peak is actually through memorial day um uh, and that's why most of the most of these years um the the top line number uh that we see is usually in june for closed sales but if you're a seller and you're listing your home in june you're not going to experience that right because we're talking about closed sales not pending sales Let's go back to the pending data for just one second. Um, the pending data, you can see oftentimes peaks much earlier. So this is um, in 2018, it peaked in March. In 2019, it peaked in May. Um, and in, and then, you know, we've got some of these uh, anomalies, uh, you know, after the pandemic. Um, last year, it peaked in April. Um, so that's pending sales. So if you're a seller, it feels busier during the spring than it does during the summer because these closed sales, you're not feeling that if you're a seller, right? You're feeling the pending sales. That's where the actual demand comes through. And then the closed sales kind of lags from that data. So just a quick follow up to that, Stan, if I'm, if I'm considering selling in the next year, should I just wait until that, you know, spring of the next year? Is it, is it worth waiting to hit that, that peak or, or how does that affect my strategy? I wouldn't say that you should uh, that you should wait. I mean, most people don't have the luxury of just waiting a year. Um, if you do have the luxury of just waiting a year to move or, or to sell, um, that's certainly a consideration. But I don't think that the seasonality of real estate should be the only consideration. Um, like I said, these these summer months still tend to be the 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 peak months of the year. It's just that. You've missed the, uh, you, you know, after Memorial Day, you've missed the the peak of the peak. But that doesn't mean that there's uh, still not good months to sell uh, real estate in. Generally speaking, where where sellers really start to feel things like feel really slow, and and particularly the past couple of years is that fourth quarter. That's when we have really seen, you know, that's when all those holidays are coming through. That's when all the kids are in school, all of that. That's when you really start to have to start making difficult decisions. Do I really want to put my home up for sale during the fourth quarter when we know that this is the slowest time of the year, or do I just want to wait another few months and try to capture some of the some of the spring winds of the next year? Um, for me, when when I personally am selling real estate, um, I don't I don't personally factor in. Okay, if I miss the if I miss the Memorial Day deadline. That now I need to to wait until you know March of, of next year. To me, that's a pretty ex extreme approach um, because there's still a lot of demand to come in. The other thing is that we don't know exactly how the the demand flows are going to even play out this year because we are still normalizing in this market. And you know, just like I I just showed with some of these um, some of the peak months um, in the past four years have been different than what they were in previous years. So could we see a scenario in, in which we have an, a busier than normal June or a busier than normal July? Absolutely. We just we just don't know. We can only look at historically and and make some, some predictions. We know for a fact that some demand comes out of the market um, after Memorial Day. Um, how much of that? It, it's, it's hard to say. 
I, I think I, I like what you said there because I shouldn't be trying to optimize, you know, and it's not like, like you mentioned, not everybody has the choice or the opportunity to optimize in that yeah. way, but it's more about finding the best option with the best real estate agent and the best presentation for your home and for, and for your situation. Um, and that's what really matters on a granular level. Whereas looking at this data, you can't really work backward from it because this is just more, you know, almost like random noise in a way yeah. uh, regarding, and it, if you, if you're looking at it through the lens of one, one person. And real estate, like, like the stock market, and th this of course isn't an investment advice. None of nothing that we say in this podcast is investment advice. Um, but real estate, like so many other things that are classified as investments, the same adage applies as it does for other things. You cannot time the market. You just you can't. Like people try to to capture lightning in a bottle by timing the market. It doesn't work. The market might crash next year. What if you hold out? What if you say, well, you know what? I want to capture the the spring, you know, busyness of next year. What if rates go even higher? What if we have eight and a half percent mortgage rates and all of these numbers are way down next year? So that would be, uh, again, we have a known commodity uh, right now and the market is doing pretty well overall um, for both buyers and sellers. You know, it's not too crazy of a seller's market. Um, and it's it's not a buyer's market, at least not according to this data. Um, but it's a slower seller's market than what it has been. Um, and so uh, I, me personally, I, I would rather take what I have now versus hope for something uh, in the future. All right, moving on to the next slide. Days on market until sale. Um, Days on market went down 11.1%. So we went all the way down from April of 2023 was 54 days on market. We went all the way down to 48 days on market in uh, April of 2024. So back down to the 40s for the first time since November. Now that great data if you're a seller, right? You're selling your home more quickly. If you're a buyer, that's not so positive. Um, although 48 days is still substantially better than when we were hovering around 20 uh, for multiple years between 2021 and 2022. Um, so um, it's it's interesting um, that it's, you know, all of these trends are trending lower than what they were a year ago. And so even though I keep hearing people saying that they feel like the market is shifting more towards the buyer's market, a lot of this isn't captured in the data for a variety of reasons. I've been waiting, I've been waiting on this days on market, uh, you know, these numbers to push back up to what they used to be, right? Because if you look at pre pandemic, we would consistently have peak months, um, typically at the beginning of the year, would end up being in the 60s or even higher. Well, we haven't seen uh, the 60s in quite some time, we came really close um, at the beginning of, of 2023. Um, I believe that that was, uh, hold on, let me see here. Yeah, that was 58 that we hit in, in March of 2023. So we got really close to hitting that 60-day marker. Um, but now we're back down into the 40s. So homes are still selling relatively quickly um, in comparison to, you know, historically what what has happened. Even if it doesn't feel that way. Uh, for for sellers right now because they're comparing they've got recency bias they're comparing to you know a lot of people selling now bought three four years ago when uh it, when homes were selling overnight basically you know the the sign would go in the yard and it'd be under contract within five hours kind of thing the market is not like that um but it's also it also hasn't gone back to what it was pre-pandemic where you know you could take a few weeks for a property that was unique and and was in a hot area you could maybe take you could maybe see it one weekend let the the week go by and then look at it the second weekend and it would and it would still be there um that is not the case for uh for homes that are you know in hot areas that are that are desirable homes that have desirable features and all of that and that are priced correctly that's obviously a very important detail so Stan, the thing that stands out to me here is just the decline from from twelve that two thousand twelve that peak, yep. down to you know where we are today. Obviously, there's the pandemic dip, but like even if you take that out and just look at the line, I, I just want to ask you, like, 
where is this headed? Because I know we can't predict the future, but like, are we, does this go back up? Does this stay low? Like, I feel like this just shows that Greenville has been a great market for, you know, a decade plus, but like, what, what does that mean to you? Or how, how can we contextualize this in the broader picture? Well, so, you know, the, the line reaches its highest over 120 uh, days on market in December of 2011. So that was the worst. That was the that was the the month in all of the data that we had that took the longest to sell your home was December of 2011. There's a variety of reasons for that. And yes, you can see that there there was a steady decline um, in this until 2018, and then it kind of normalized until um, until uh, the pandemic happened, and then it went way down, and now it's come back up. It's still below what it was in 2018, 2019. Um, what I think is um, at, at some point, um, if if rates kind of stay where they are, I think that we would likely see this line kind of stay about where it is. But here's what's going to happen at some point, most likely, is that uh, mortgage rates are going to come back down. And when, when mortgage rates come back down, this number is going to drop because we've got all this pent up demand. All these people sitting on the sidelines waiting, you know, they, they can't afford a home right now, um, you know, with rates being around 7%. If we see rates go below 6%, all bets are off. Um, this 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 line is going to go way back down again. Days on market is going to plummet back into the 30s. God forbid the 20s. I, I hope not the 20s, I, I but I could see that. Um, and so I think what we'll probably see for the rest of this year is we'll probably see you know, this followed the normal trend, right? So the normal trend is that uh, the days on market go down through the summer months and then peak back up during the fall and winter months. It's looking like it's gonna it's gonna peak um, at a lower number for of days on market than it has uh, the past year. Uh, but then, if if mortgage rates come down anytime soon, if we see you know, and 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 I'm not just talking about like a, a minor minor mortgage rates. I'm talking about coming down, you know, like an entire point, for instance, um, or a hundred basis points. Uh, then, then we'll see this number. Uh, we'll see days on market go way down again. Homes are going to be selling overnight again, kind of thing is what I'm concerned about. Um, and I think that that's, that's a very real possibility. So, um, it's going to be years before we see this go back to pre pandemic norms is what I think. And what I think will be required for us to see that is once all the demand from the baby boomer generation starts to dwindle, because they are really propping up so much of the of the housing market right now from a demand standpoint. The, you know, the most active, you know, purchasers of real estate in their 60s to 80s that we have probably ever seen. Um, and so, uh, but census data indicates that by the early 2030s, that will pretty much be done. Um, and so I think, you know, we might be a few years away. We're, we're going to see this go way down, but then we're a few years away from it going back up. And then at that point, you know, we'll probably see something that resembles what it looked like, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. So I, I picked up on two things you said there. The There's a pretty tight correlation between uh, interest rates and this days on market number. And then you kind of mentioned the pressure that the the boomer generation is kind of still active in a way that's that's re, uh, significant, right? So yep. um, those things I heard. But what what you also mentioned in there was you hope the number doesn't go back down to twenty. And I guess I would just ask you. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. What is there something bad that happens when when this number goes that low? Yeah, that's that's a that's a market that's uh, really just stressful for everyone. Obviously, that's indicative of an insane seller's market. I consider that to be an unhealthy seller's market um, because what's happening when you see days on market at twenty, what that indicates is that there, you know, you've got to factor in that there's a lot of homes that, you know, even in a, an insane seller's market, aren't going to sell for sixty, ninety days because they were just overpriced. They've got all sorts of problems, et cetera, et cetera. So for all of that to average out to 20 days on market, that means that a huge portion of the market is selling within 24 to 48 hours, maybe even less than that. 
Um, that's stressful for buyers. I can't tell you when, when the market was like that, how many times I would show up at a home to show it and would get a call from the, you know, the listing agent, Hey, we just went under contract. Um, and it was like, I mean, in some cases I had driven like an hour to, to show that home and only to find out that it had just gone under contract. Um, that, that was the market when buyers might have to put in, you know, seven or eight offers before they get one accepted and sellers, um, even though, you know, it's kind of fun, uh, in a sense to, to experience that it's also kind of stressful too, when, when it's that constrained of a market, things are selling that quickly, there's that much demand and that little supply, which is the only thing that causes that kind of dynamic, you're having to have a ton of showings in your home. Um, you can't discriminate against showings. Like once you list your home, MLS rules are you have to allow showings. Um, so you can't just say, you know, I'm only going to allow four showings today. You can't do it. Legally, you cannot do that. You cannot list your home on MLS and then and then do something like that. So that become, you know, during this period of time when days on market was so low, we had sellers that were um, listing their home on a weekend and then going on vacation because it was just so stressful um, and, and for them to go through all of that. And then you get 25 offers. Well, me as a realtor, if I'm the listing agent or any listing agent, legally, you have to present every one of those offers. Well, that could be a four hour conversation, depending on how much detail you go into and 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 all of that. That's also kind of stressful. So it's just a it, it is uh, there's there's a lot of reasons why nobody really likes the market to be that intense. It's just a bit much. Uh, really for all parties involved, but particularly for buyers, but but even for sellers as well, even though they once they get to the end of it, they're really happy. Um, but um, but the process is still pretty stressful. Does that make sense? Yeah, that clarifies a lot. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. So let's move on to median sales price. Um, we look at the median to kind of gauge, you know, what's happening in the market. It's It's not one to one like this is an appreciating market if this number is going up or one-to-one -one that is a depreciating market if it's going down. Um, but at the end of the day, this is loosely speaking what we look at and what we uh, judge the market off of the trajectory of where it's going. If we get a bunch of months in a row that are positive year-on-year -year median sales price, that tells you it is an appreciating market. If we get a bunch of months in a row with uh, negative year on year, then that is, uh, generally speaking, a depreciating market. So you got to look at this, uh, data as a whole. You can't just look at it one month at a time. Um, but that being said, let's look at one month for now. And then I'll, I'll put some, uh, some flesh on the bones here. April's median sales price was exactly the same as March. We we're at 310,000, which is interesting. So no month on month increase, um, not that uncommon. Um, if you know, if you look at past years, you can see that there will be even month on month decreases. So we're likely to see that this summer as well. We're likely to see some months that go way up and then some months that, that uh, recede from that. Uh, but year on year, it is a 2.4% increase from April of 2023. That was at 302,788. Um, we have now experienced 11 straight months of uh, median sales price year on year increases. So this is very clearly a an appreciating market. Um, although the appreciation has slowed a bit, right? So we've uh, we've now had uh, going back to December of last year, we've had five straight months of uh, of uh, the rate of of the median sales price going up has slowed down. So December was six point seven year on year uh, increase. January was four point two down to February three point two. Um, March, actually March went up a little bit to 3.4, but now April is back down to 2.4%. Um, but this is a pretty, this is a pretty healthy number. Like if we saw 2.4% appreciation in the Greenville market, most people would be very happy about that. Sellers are still seeing gains. Like, yeah, you might be hearing that and being like, well, that's not good. And compared to stocks and compared to the S and P, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, real estate's not stocks, Right. Um, it doesn't appreciate in the same way that stocks do. It's also not taxed in the same way that stocks are. Um, but I think most people would be happy if we stayed in that 2.4% range. I don't think we will. I think, you know, I think we're still going to see uh, see increases that exceed 2.4% here in future months. 
Um, but that's where we are right now. It's an appreciating market, but it's not an appreciating market like we've seen some other times where we've seen the the year on year percent, you know, back during the craziness of COVID, some months might be 15 or 20 percent. Thankfully, we've not seen that. Stan, my question on this one is how this seems like a really kind of high level number that's that's um, a good way to get a, an overview. How much has the recent inflation that we've been seeing kind of like at the grocery store or et cetera, does that factor in here at all? Or is this kind of able to kind of smooth that out and, and be separated? That's a good question. It's not these are not inflation adjusted numbers. So you could make the argument, certainly, that the 2.4% year on year increase is actually a net decrease if you factored it in for inflation. This is an argument that some people have made. And um, and you can't refute that argument, right? I mean, if you just have your cash in in the bank, um, you're generally speaking, even if you've got a, a money market account that's you know bringing you four and a half percent, whatever, um, you're you're still generally speaking losing out versus inflation. Um, so these are not inflation adjusted numbers. You can you can find that number for the national market um, in uh, in other places. We don't analyze it in that way in the uh, you know for this Greater Greenville Association of Realtors statistics. Um, but uh, but yeah, does that does that answer your question on that? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of what I was getting at. I just wanted to know like how how that played into this, and it seems like. It's almost like a separate, you'd have to run a separate uh, comparison to kind of get that number. Yeah, you have to create a whole model in order to mm -hmm. uh, in order to create inflation adjusted numbers, which is well above my pay grade because I'm not an economist. Um, but uh, but people that really want to get into that, um, I believe the Federal Reserve has some of that uh, has some of that data out there. There's also data that's produced by um, uh, Housing Wire has some really good stuff like that out there. Um, uh, yeah, a, a few sources like that where you can you can find some of that if you really want to look at, OK, what months uh, do we see true inflation adjusted increases versus what months are we just seeing standard appreciation? Uh, but the important thing for people to know as they look at this is um, most people, when they think of home home prices, they don't think of it in, in inflation adjusted dollars. Right. All they think about is I bought. Or, or these people bought this home in 2019 for $200,000, and now they've got it listed for uh, for $300,000, and that seems insane to me. That's that's the way people look at it. They don't ever analyze the data based on inflation, um, hardly ever. Only, only the experts do uh, from what I have seen. Um, and so we look at this on, on more of a high level, and for most people, that works. Now the average sales price, which I don't spend as much time focused on because averages are skewed by the homes at the top and the bottom. The median just picks out the middle number in a data set. So that's usually the number that experts use when they are looking at real estate data. But I like to look at the average as well. It's kind of interesting. If you really wanna know what the true average price of, of a home in Greenville is, it's 371,945. So basically 372,000. And that was a 2.6% increase versus April of 2023, which was 362,536. Um, again, I'm not drawing any major conclusions from this because this number um, tends to do kind of some wonky things. Like if we have a few million dollar homes sold in a month, that greatly skews the data in, in a market like Greenville that doesn't have a ton of million dollar homes. Um, or, you know, if we have a single, you know, new construction community that sells 50 units in in one month um that you know even something as basic as that can skew the data right we we just discussed that the closed sales was what i think it was like 2200 so if you get you know 50 uh you know a community of of 50 that sells that's a, a part of that 2200 that's actually a pretty large subset so i don't draw a whole lot of conclusions from this um but the the thing that I find most interesting is that we now have 12 straight months of the average increasing year on year. We've gone all the way up, um, you know, from like I said, it was 362,000 in April of 2023. Now it's 371,000, um, and every single month for the past year has seen a a year on year increase. Um, and I suspect that 
that that will likely continue because the luxury housing market is starting to become more of a staple in the Greenville market. And that causes these numbers to go up. I don't have a question. I just have a comment that this this 371 number kind of surprises me. It's higher than I expected. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And again, I, I would focus more on the 310 number at, at the mm -hmm. at the median. Like if people ask me what is the average home sale in Greenville, I don't tell them 372. I tell them 310. Um, yeah. because that is a more accurate, even though tech, I'm technically lying because that isn't the average, it's the median, but it's answering the question that people really have, which is if I were to buy a home right in the, in the middle, what would that be? And that would be 310,000. Yeah, I think that's fair. Percent of list price received. This is the percentage found when dividing a property sales price by its most recent list price. So it doesn't take into account price drops. Okay. Important detail. Um, then taking the average for all properties sold in a given month, not accounting for seller concessions. So the two caveats I frequently make is the one I already made, which this is taking the most recent list price. So it's not accounting for price drops. It's not accounting for seller concessions, meaning if a seller is paying for a buyer's closing costs, that's not being factored in here. Um, but with all of those caveats in mind, uh, we saw our first decrease in the percent of list price received in several months in April, it went down only 0.1%. It went down from 98.7% April 2023 down to 98.6% April 2024, which is exactly the same as what March of 2024 was. So what that means, generally speaking, if you're a seller, you can expect to get 98.6% of what your home is listed for. And likely um, buyers are going to ask for a little bit of of closing costs as well on top of that if your home has been on the market for uh for some time uh that's a pretty good uh, a pretty reasonable assumption to make um and these numbers are are really um are, are some of the most normal numbers on here right these numbers are real close to what we saw in 2019 uh and and in 2018 you know before things kind of got out of whack during the pandemic Yeah, so when I'm when I'm looking at this, I see that uh, 101.4 number. So that's basically pandemic time, right? When when basically you're getting it's an outlier as far as these numbers are concerned, where you're getting more than you asked for. Which one are you um, looking at? What month? April of 2022. When you look at the the bar ah, chart yes. there on the yep. left. Yeah. So, so so we had that stretch between um, we had that stretch between early 2021 and mid 2022 when um you know when we had those super low rates and when the market really went crazy where sellers could actually expect to get more than what their home was listed for um as a result of the tremendous demand combined with um with just insanely low supply um in in contrast to the demand so that that pushed prices to do something that they had never done before that pushed buyers to do things that they had never done before, um, which was having to offer substantial, in many cases, substantially above what a seller had a home listed for just in order to win uh, in a bidding war kind of situation. So that that was, that's what's happening there. Yeah, it's that chaos that you were describing earlier. And it's not fun. Again, it's, it's not fun to go through that, right? If you're a buyer, you know, you're, you're, you've got a certain, you know, max price that you're looking for. Now you have to factor in also, you're going to have to go above whatever, you know, the seller has the home listed for pretty much guaranteed, no matter what you end up making an offer on. Um, it just creates a lot of complications. And so um, this number 98.6%, that's a very comfortable number for me, for, for most sellers, for most buyers, most sellers expect to get a little bit less than what they've listed a home for. And that is the way the market has normally worked. Buyers typically expect that that they don't have to pay at or above what a home is listed for unless it has just come on the market. Um, and so uh, that that's a very comfortable number for most people. If it stays like that, um, I think that, I think everyone will be pretty happy with that from the standpoint of, of this specific data set, the percent of list price received. So I have a follow-up question here. You see this is now 98.6, indicating things have kind of normalized. Does that help you or factor into when you're when you're helping someone list their home for how to price it? Um, 
this number specifically doesn't what what this number helps me not in terms of pricing a home um pricing a home really you're looking at what the other homes in the area have sold for and then kind of backing into the number that way um i don't you know some people might look at this and say well i want to get three hundred thousand dollars and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to list it for 305000 thinking that I'll get 98.6% of that, which will get me, I don't know, I don't know if that gets you to 300000 I can't do that math in my head that quickly. <laughs> um, but that's the, that's really the wrong way to go about this because uh, markets don't work that way, right? The the 98.6% is the fair market value. You can't You can't game the system. You can't produce your own fair market value for a home. Um, so the reason the, that 1.4% gap between 100% and 98.6%, that is simply uh, sellers overpricing their home at the end of the day. That is that is what that is. So sellers that think I can further overprice my home in order to get a higher number, that's just not how real estate markets work. Um, so you've got to look at what things have actually sold for and why, and then price it according to that and not, you know, not try to outsmart uh the markets because you will you just you won't be able to outsmart the market that's actually a great question i'm sure that people have thought about that um when i've done this uh podcast in the past and uh and i'm and i'm sure that question has come up um housing affordability index uh i have complained about this number multiple times i don't even really know what it means anymore but long story short um if it's at 100 that means that the average household can buy the average priced home, uh, loosely speaking, um, and it's now at 95. But but the, this number has changed so many different times that I, I, I don't even know what to make of it anymore. But long story short, based on the data that we have here, the average household can only afford 95% of the average priced home. Do you have any any thoughts of that? That that is a four percent decrease year on year from April of twenty twenty three, when it was at ninety nine percent. My only thought is I'm trying to understand it. This yeah, index okay. measures so, housing yep. affordability for the region. For example, an index of one hundred twenty means the median household income is one hundred twenty percent of what is necessary to qualify for the median priced home. Okay. <laughs> So, 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 so a lot so, of medians in there. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Joel, for those of you listening, Joel was just, uh, was just reading off the, the description of the housing affordability index off of the slide. Um, so basically this, this, what they're packaging into this 95 number is the median household income, the median priced home and whatever the prevailing mortgage rates were for that month. And then it's reverse engineering based on all of those, based on those three things. It's it's coming up with a number where a hundred means exactly that the median household income can afford the median priced home based on interest rates. So we want that number to be at a hundred or above, uh, generally speaking, for our market to be at least at the the most basic level of affordability for our. Uh, for the people that live in the Greenville area, so at 95, um, that's not the worst number in the world. Um, you can you can see that uh, in in early 2023, it was in the low 90s. Um, so 95 isn't too bad. Um, but we would like we'd really like to see that number at or above 100, so that buy you know average buyers can buy an average house. Yeah, the description has a final sentence that says a higher number means greater affordability. I That's should right. I wish they would have led with that because that would have helped me kind of simplify it a little right. bit. I, 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 I get it now where if the number is 100 or greater, that means I've got more buying power essentially. Yeah, so think about it this way. the We just discussed the median was 310,000, right? That's the median mm -hmm. priced home right now. So the the average family can only afford, you know, 99% of, 95% of that. So that uh, 294,500 dollar home. Um, yep. and, so and and the the factors there being the um, the interest rate, their income, and uh, what was the other factor? The cost the cost of the home itself. The cost of the home. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think I get it now. So if we saw interest rates go down, 
this number should pop back up because interest rates, mm -hmm. even though we would see the median price really start to soar at that point, if, if interest rates went down, um, the impact on a monthly payment of the interest rates is much greater than, you know, you, so let's say we went from a 7% mortgage rate to a five and a half percent rate. That would be a, that would have much more impact on, on housing affordability than it would if, uh, for instance, prices went down by fifteen or twenty thousand um, dollars. So, so this number will improve if mortgage rates improve. Inventory of homes for sale. This is uh, the number of properties available for sale and active status at the end of a given month. We we discussed that briefly earlier. Um, I, this is also a number that is frequently inaccurate for the most recent month. So, for instance, March. Uh, when when these stats came out last month, March was at 4,215. That got revised down again by 500, basically down to 3,728. Um, but the interesting detail is that that makes March um, year on year 24.5% uh, higher inventory than March of 2023, which was 2,994. April came in at 4,493. That's probably going to get revised down into the the you know thirty nine hundred range. That will also be a massive increase from April twenty twenty three. That was two thousand eight hundred ninety six. This is one of the most eye popping numbers that I'm looking at here because what this tells me is that we are now at inventory levels that are pretty much right on par with what we saw uh, pre pandemic. So if you're a buyer, okay, you have as many options for housing right now, as you would have five or six years ago. Now, those options are a lot more expensive and mortgage rates are a lot higher and a lot of things have changed, but you have as many options in terms of the number of homes for sale as you had, <clears throat> excuse me, as you had a few years ago, pre-pandemic. And that's one of the few things on here that are truly going back to the pre-pandemic norms. So Stan, you earlier you you said you'd heard reference to people saying, "Oh, it's a buyer's market." This, to me, of everything that we've talked about, it seems like the only, uh, you know, the only case where that is true, essentially, yes. from the numbers that we've talked about. Is that right? That that is right, and this is probably the the big reason why people. Well, this is one of the reasons why people, when they say, "I think it's a buyer's market," this is one of the main things that they're looking at. Um, they're also looking at things like days on market and whatnot. What, what they're experiencing is is just recency bias, right? When your <clears throat> neighbor a couple of years ago sold their home for $300,000 and went under contract in two days and it, it was listed for 285 and it sold for 300 and you know the the uh, buyer didn't ask for any closing costs because they couldn't um, and they the seller didn't have to do any repairs because they had negotiated it would be an as-is contract, all this kind of stuff. And now here you are in 2024, a few years later, and um, you you know you're listing your house. Your neighbor listed their house for 285 and sold it for 300. Well, you're looking at comps, and and you're still thing seeing. Well, my house might only be worth 310 uh, based on the comps, maybe 315. And it's it you know you list it for 315, and then it takes several months to sell, and it only sells for 305, and um, and you know, then the the buyer asks for you to do repairs and all of that. You're comparing that to when the market was the unhealthiest and the most extreme seller's market that it has ever been. So that's not a fair comparison. Um, that's not what constitutes the buyer's market isn't the uh, normalization of the most extreme seller's market of all time. It is all of the data, even, even if you go back to this period of time that we're talking about 2017 2018 2019 that was still a seller's market okay people forget that it just wasn't people have in their mind that a seller's market equals what 20 uh you know 2020 mid 2020 through mid 2022 was that is hopefully never going to happen again hopefully we'll never see a seller's market like that that is the extreme of extremes when it comes to that um a seller's market is simply when demand outpaces supply that's all that that is demand outpaces supply um and 
historically speaking, when we have around in Greenville, around 4,000 uh, ish, uh, 4,100, 4,200 homes for sale, that's traditionally still a seller's market. Now, it honestly is even more of a seller's market now. There's more demand in the market now than there was back in 2018, 2017, 2019. How do we know that? Well, look at some of these other things that we've looked at. Look, pending sales, we've already talked about that, um, are generally speaking higher than most of these years were. Closed sales, generally speaking, higher than most of these years were. Now, we'll have to see the way the rest of this plays out. Um, and again, demand is being suppressed right now on the basis of um, of these higher rates. There's, there's pent up demand uh, that I've referenced now a few times, but, um, but here we are, you know, with, with inventory at similar levels to what it's been a few years ago, you should not confuse that with a seller's market, uh, or with a, sorry, with a buyer's market. Um, we're not there yet. What would it take for us to get there? Um, uh, we'd probably need to start getting into the high fours is, is what I think. Um, so again, this, the, the April number is going to be revised down. It's, it's currently saying 4493. Um, that's going to get revised down into either the high threes or the low fours. Um, so in my opinion, we're nowhere, nowhere near what it would take for this to be, um, technically speaking, a true buyer's market. Yeah. What you're describing would be a 25% increase over where we will yep. be revised down to, which is just massive, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're not there yet. Month supply of inventory. Um, Got to be careful with this one because this is dividing um, the inventory of homes for sale, which I just said is inaccurate for the most recent months by the pending sales from the last 12 months, which I already said is also inaccurate for the most uh, most recent months. So the April number of 3.6 is not going to be accurate. So it says it's 3.6 months supply of inventory. That's going to be wrong. That's going to be revised back down. Um, mostly it'll probably be revised back down to somewhere between three and 3.2 months supply of, of inventory, which will still be a big increase year on year. But let's look back to March of 24. Um, this number should be accurate by now. So it was 2.9 months of inventory, which was a 26% increase year on year over March of 23, which was 2.3 uh, months of inventory. So this is also an indicator of of the pressure relief valve for buyers that there is more months supply of inventory. Now, historically speaking, being in the low threes, which is what that April number will get revised to, um, that is still historically a, a pretty low number, but it's starting to get pretty close to what the pre-pandemic numbers were. Um, and so uh, that that's, again, something that buyers should be should be happy about because this does factor in the demand side of things. Now, again, once rates go down, I suspect that month supply will will go back down as well, and it'll be a little bit more of a constrained market as well. Um, but that's not something that we have to worry about, most likely for several months, if not a year or or more, the, the way things are looking at the moment. So a question I have here is, I know we've kind of established that it's not really a true buyer's market, but does this indicate that like, if you're able to swallow the higher price or, or manage that and manage, you know, if you're willing to accept the the higher interest rate that, that we've been experiencing recently, does this mean like, Hey, it's a good time to go shopping and look around or, or how do you, how do you see that fitting in here? Um, again, um, if, if you're a, a buyer in this market, you've got to think about what do you know, okay? Don't don't focus too much on the unknowns because a lot of people have gotten hosed trying to focus on the unknowns, trying to, trying to time the market. A lot of buyers have been waiting for these mortgage rates to come down. Well, guess what? As the mortgage rates haven't come down, we've seen prices continue to go up. That's what we just looked at with the, with the median price point. So for those that have been waiting for the past year, um, things are less affordable now than than they were a year ago. Um, so I personally prefer to focus on a known commodity. If you need to move, um, you know, a, a common phrase that people say is marry the house and date the rate. 
Okay. What that means is um, buy the house that you love. If you have to hold your nose with the mortgage rate, because mortgage rates are temporarily high and the Fed has told us it is temporary, whether you believe them or not. Um, and, and so you date the rate a couple of years from now, rates have gone down a point, one and a half points, two points, whatever the case may be. You've already got the house that you want. Now you can refinance and now bring that payment down, you know, it, and make it more manageable. Hopefully your income has also increased during that time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's generally speaking, and again, generally speaking, good advice for people is marry the house, date the rate. Um, and, and, you know, again, if you waited for those rates to go down, my fear for buyers is that they've waited too long, right? It's like, it's like waiting until, you know, um, un until the, the day before Christmas to get in your Christmas shopping or, or waiting. Maybe a better example is waiting until, you know, the day of Halloween to, to find your Halloween costume It's too late, right? The, the, the holiday is upon us. Everyone's already picked on, picked at everything, um, it, it, you, you're, you're too late. You're really going to struggle by the time the rates have come down. Now, all of that pent up demand, uh, you know, it gets washed into the market. And now you're going to start to see those more extreme bidding wars. The, the, all these other things we've been talking about that have started to normalize are going to become not normal again is what I predict. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm a bit wary of, you know, waiting for additional normalization uh because i i think quite frankly that uh that we're this the way it feels right now this is probably about the best that it's going to be for for quite some time uh for buyers it's really interesting the way that you kind of uh your guidance that you're suggesting here because like for me when i look at that you know as someone who's less experienced i'm like oh it could be good but like yeah that tendency to want to time the market, it, it, you've, you've, you've identified as, you know, really problematic. So I, I like the fact that, you know, what you're focused on is like getting, making sure there's a good fit and making it work with, with what we've got, with what we know. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't just say this as a realtor, I like I practice what I preach. Um, when I moved a couple of years ago, I swallowed almost a double uh, my my mortgage rate that I ended up with was almost double what it was at my old house. Um, but it was it was time to move, you know. It and the opportunity arose. The house that I really wanted, um, you know, became available. And you know, again, I held my nose at at the at the mortgage rate and said, hopefully these rates will come down in the future. But this is the house that I want, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let it get past me. I mean, I've seen this over and over again. You, I mean, there are homes that I, that my wife and I attempted to buy when we had no money back in, you know, 2000, 2010, um, that, you know, I could have bought for, you know, like a hundred thousand that I've seen now sell a few times since then, you know, in the high threes, low fours, you know, like this is, this is the way the Greenville market is. We've got 22 people per day moving here. And, um, and that just creates a stable baseline of demand that um that ultimately causes prices to continue to go up and so um you control what you can control right what you can control you can't control mortgage rates what you can control is actually purchasing a home that you like right now um and so generally speaking that's that's good advice for for most buyers um but again every situation is unique any uh, any other closing thoughts or or questions about any of that before I? Uh, I mean, my before I can conclude this thing out. My closing thoughts are: this was a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot. I, I feel like there's a lot more I have to learn. So it, it, for me, it was really good to kind of get in there, kind of see what these numbers were about, but also see the pitfalls that are there. And I think you yep. you guided me through that really well, and I appreciate it. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Really appreciate it. And thank you guys for listening or for watching. Uh, reminder, if you like this content, please like, rate, review, subscribe, particularly subscribe um, so you don't miss it in the future. Whatever podcast app you're using, um, if you're watching or listening on YouTube as well, same thing. 
And uh, if you need a realtor in the Greenville area, I'm your guy. My contact information is in the show notes. If you need to reach out to Joel, reach out to me and I'll connect you with Joel. And uh, thank you guys once again. And we will talk again next time.